Great. So welcome everybody to the fourth meetup on uh, the, the latest uh, version three Fast AI deep learning course. So just taking you through the agenda for the uh, study hour that we have for now. So of course, uh, you know, we start with the recap of uh, what this study group is all about, what we intend to achieve. Uh, we will go through what we did in the last meetup. Uh, also take a high level overview on what was covered in lesson number four, which was done this week and followed by a couple of mini presentations. Uh, one of them will be done by me and the other will be done by Christian. And then we go through what is kind of what everybody wants to pitch in and uh, then take it forward. So that's the agenda for the day. And uh, we have a system of rotating hosts, as you can see here. So I'm the host for this particular session. So if anything is wrong, you can blame me uh, on that. And it'll be followed by others who are there in the list for the subsequent weeks. Yeah, so just, just to the, so for next week, we had some change, unforeseen changes and Vino can no longer host the meetup. So if anyone wants to lead for next week, it's, uh, it's open. So just let us, let us know and we'll, uh, we'll arrange it. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So drop us a message on Slack or, you know, on the chat here and, and Mikhail will take that up with you. Thanks, Mikhail. Um, okay, so what do we want to achieve as a part of this group? Uh, basically be able to help each other out, uh, provide encouragement and support. I am personally a recipient of that. So this is my sixth or seventh uh, kind of a meetup that I've been doing with uh, Trimline now. And it's been of great help. I've been able to meet interesting people, get help along the way. So I can personally watch for uh, this being a, a good uh, you know, group to soundboard your ideas and get help. Okay, so uh, the, the way we do it is what I have explained, uh, but uh, what we want to achieve is to do it and then learn it rather than uh, get into this habit of, uh, you know, doing a lot of theory, trying to learn what the baseball bat is all about instead of just going to the ground and using the baseball bat and hit the ball that is the ground, right? So that's uh, what we don't want to do. Uh, we want to uh, learn by doing it, and that's what we, the whole study group is all about, and the methodology is all about, and that's what even uh, Jeremy talks about as a part of the course. Okay, so yeah, so this is the schedule of uh, the deep learning sessions. We have now completed four lessons. The last lesson was completed this week, followed by the one next week on Monday. Monday for some and Tuesday for the others, depending on which time zone you are. And uh, goes on to be completed on the 12th of uh, December with a, a week's break in between, right? Uh, but we do have our sessions on Trimli continuing throughout uh, without any breaks. So that's what you can see for lesson number six. Uh, we have two study groups starting for December 1st and 8th, not necessarily covering only lesson one, lesson six, but basically the study groups continue even though there is a break in terms of the fast AI live sessions themselves. Okay, so let's go through what we did in the last meetup. Um, it started out with Jeremy giving his, uh, you know, lessons on the CAMVID and uh, the segmentation data sets, and also wanting us to try this on other data sets as well, right? So that was uh, the, the whole point of the lesson at the point of time. Uh, we did a uh, meet up using that lesson and uh, dive deeper on it. We had a couple of participants from the study group who went up to do mini presentations. Hyder, who goes by the name of uh, Avasti in this particular study group, did the visualization of model architecture. And we had a discussion on spectrogram images from Kodzax. And Sanyam, I think, went on to do a recap of his uh, doodle challenge experience uh, with Kaggle, followed by the question and answers. So that was what we kind of achieved in the in the last meetup. Okay, so now the interesting bit, what we did cover in lesson number four, and uh, what is it that was awaiting us? I've tried to capture it at a high level, and you know, please jump in and add to it uh, as you you know go through it. So the first part of it was the language model. Uh, where we created using the wiki text model and the wiki text data set, sorry. 
and the whole point of uh, the highlight for me at least was the fact that uh, a transfer learning model could be used uh, which is what we have seen in say a convolutional neural network from an image perspective that being translated to a text slash recurrent neural network kind of a model where we took a model that was trained on Wikitext data vest and tried to apply it to the IMDB uh, data sets which could do the classification and uh, that did a pretty good job of uh, doing that bit. We also saw uh, a new uh, class of data bunch called text beta data bunch. We learned about tokenization. We also saw that there were changes um, to data black API and, and this we have seen this is in kind of an evolving library based itself as we go through the course. Uh, there were changes, uh, small changes to the data block API, but uh, they were there. We also saw how you could use the, the fast AI library also on a tabular uh, data set. And Jeremy was particularly mentioning that, uh, you know, uh, neural networks were not actually doing so good on the tabular data sets. And that is something, uh, you know, fast AI has been able to achieve by coming up with a method for that as well. And then we went through collaborative filtering. Uh, one is uh, from a notebook perspective, the other is where uh, Jeremy took all of this, put it into an Excel sheet and showed us how it actually works, right? How, what is an embedding? Uh, how are words initialized? What is matrix multiplication? What is an activation? Uh, what is a, you know, sigmoid activation on top of it? And so forth. So basically a combination of linear and then nonlinear uh, activations. So uh, that led to me to, to meet uh, a very big understanding of what the universal approximation theorem is and, and what he meant by that as what I understood was when you combine a, a linear activation with a nonlinear activation and do a series of steps, basically you create a function that can fit anything, right? So that's what this universal approximation theorem is all about as well. So that was the fact and then uh, you know, it was also surprising when he kind of said that uh, this is it, right? You know, what is the weight? What is a matrix multiplication? What's an activation? All you need to do about deep learning is already there. And it's, it's kind of uh, only kind of going into each of these intricacies going forward in the remaining uh, lessons. So that was where we kind of, uh, you know, uh, took a break. Uh, I just wanted to kind of leave it open to you guys to pitch in with what your thoughts were on the lesson and uh, discuss any specific things that you may have on it. Yeah, I mean, to me, that was like probably the best one yet because now we, we get the, the good stuff that's really new. Like like the image stuff is, is nice and, and, and cool and everything. But for me, tabular data and... Um, his 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 uh, transfer learning on 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 NLP that's really something which I was really looking forward to it and unfortunately I haven't really used it yet because I mean image data sets I guess are just easier to get and and to 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 make your own right for for text and stuff it's quite tedious to build it up but that's something I definitely want to do if I find the time I found found it a really good one really enjoyed it. Yep. Uh, I tried to run the IMDB notebook. It's like taking forever uh, to run yeah. on GCP. Yeah, yeah, I was training it. I didn't think about it and I started it. <laughs> it was like four hours <laughs> or whatever. No, no, okay. Yeah. yeah Did so anyone try yeah, um, the tabular data on, on any other data set to see how, how accurate it was and what sort of, um, and, and did it compare to say, you know, like a, a any other machine learning model? That's actually what I what I plan. So we 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 have uh, Mike, Michael and some others. We we do the uh, ML course as well, and we up to till the last lesson, or to the next one actually, we only used random forests. And basically, uh, we were working on a couple of data sets, and I was working on the on the taxi data, the taxi New York data set, and I wanted basically to. Uh, benchmark it against uh, this random forest prediction and see like if that's really bad and I mean and I understood that this um, uh, neural net would, would be able to predict right and that's the big thing about random forest that they can't predict so I, I, I really thought okay that would be a good test but I haven't done anything yet but that's on my agenda.
Yeah. Uh, so I try. Yeah. So I tried this neural network approach, tabular neural network approach on my work problem. So we had this problem where we have around 60 features and we need to predict the attrition of the employees. So earlier with the with basic model of uh, random forest and XG boost, we were able to achieve only 6% of the recall and 45% of the accuracy. But after replacing random forest and XG boost with this tabular model neural network approach, we received around 45% of the recall and 54% accuracy. So it really helped and boosted the accuracy and recall in our case. And this is and this is an actual problem and not a curated Kaggle data set. So uh, we applied this on our work and it helped. Another uh, thing that can be tried is uh, processing uh, your uh, input data through a neural network and then using those as features uh, on a random forest or XGBoost. That also helps in my opinion. Sorry, could you say that again? Can you so uh, instead of uh, predicting uh, out of a neural network, just uh, process the, uh, the input data through a neural network so that it outputs all the embeddings that it learns and then use those embeddings as features uh, for a machine learning model. So that tends to work better. That's interesting. Do, do you know, do you have an intuition why that is? Uh, I, I did the part two of that course, uh, uh, part one of this course, uh, the earlier version of deep learning in uh, that it was mentioned. Interesting. Yeah. On the yeah. bulldozer data set, I think uh, on Jeremy tried on that. Okay. I mean, something else that I found interesting was that basically Jeremy mentioned that he was using random forest for his uh, uh, hyperparameter search, right? Uh, yeah. if, I, if I had this correct, so he was basically doing random forest interpretation on his on, on his grid search. That was kind of interesting. Yeah, that's a, that's what the explanation was for the number two point six. Yeah, exactly the magic yeah. number. Yeah. Regarding the tabular the tabular data, I, I I was a little surprised. Jeremy said, you know, two years ago. Uh, people thought using neural networks for tabular data was a terrible idea. But recently, they, there's been a, um, a conventional wisdom has changed. I'm not sure why he says that. I think for a long time, uh, for example, for things like fraud detection, uh, you know, neural networks have been used since the early 1990s very successfully to, uh, in a commercial application to identify credit card and debit card fraud. Uh, in fact, it was claimed to be the most successful application, commercial application of artificial intelligence in the 1990s was using neural networks on tabular data for credit card fraud detection. Uh, and, and that's when the credit card fraud, detect, um, fraud decreased across uh, most countries when that company introduced that product. And that was about 25 years ago. So I, I don't, and there's been a lot of use of it since then. I'm not sure why he says. So uh, uh, it was maybe it wasn't as easy as it could be now in fast AI library, perhaps. Uh, I, I think it wasn't much talked about in the community uh, because uh, the conventional wisdom is that neural networks work better on uh, continuous data but uh, tabular data is kind of discrete. So uh, this paper came along uh, titled uh, Entity Embeddings for C Categorical Variables. So uh, once that paper was published, uh, that categorical data can be treated as somewhat like uh, language models where you make en embedding matrices for all the uh, categorical data. Then it turns into a continuous data and neural networks tend to work better. Yeah, so I agree. One more reason was uh, there was no simple direct API to use it. So with early, earlier version also, and this year he mentioned that uh, using fast AI, we can make things very easy. And maybe this is why people were not using it because things were, were not very easy to use with tablet data. I, I have a basic question. What 
what is the definition of tabular data? For me, anything which you can store in a table like SQL or in CSV. Yeah, I guess where, where all of the columns are the same, where all the columns are the same, um, same number of columns. Um, sorry, same number of rows regardless of the number of columns. So like an Excel document. But you right, so I mean in that sense. Structural data, right, where you have structured data available. Yeah, yeah, so I'm imagining um, you, you're presented with a hundred or a million examples, and each example has a value for each of uh, ten or a hundred or a thousand features. So it's it's quite structured like that. But that doesn't mean that those features have to be categorical or something. They can be, uh, you yeah. know, numbers, absolutely, uh, like, uh, like age in number of seconds or milliseconds or the uh, distance that some object has traveled. Um, so it can. Uh, it can be continuous and categorical and a mixture of, of various things, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, so another, another fairly trivial question. Um, and he didn't get into this, um, and it's, I think he said he's going to get into it next week, but it, it, does anyone have a, a high level view of, you know, what does the model look like for tabular data? What model are we actually using? What, what does that 200 by 100 or whatever mean? Yeah, I mean, if I understand it right, it's it's just a fully connected network, right? So it's got a couple hidden layers, but I do think it's like more straightforward than the image ones, which can get like a little bit crazy. I think the one for tabular data kind of just stacks a couple of fully connected layers together. Yeah, so, yeah, so basically you will find the embeddings of the categorical variables and then use those embeddings concat with your uh, numerical features and pass it through fully connected layers. So those 200 and 100 were two layers. That's it. Okay, thank you. No problem. Any, any thoughts on, you know, you know, what's the kind of, uh, activities people are doing with this. One is to, of course, go through the lessons and then see how they're firing up. Some of us have problems running those lessons, you know, GCP, AWS, whichever the case may be. Whereas, uh, you know, is anybody working on one having run the lessons on something that is different? Well, I'm, I'm hoping to try to investigate Excel a little bit more. I was quite interested. I thought it was a very good example. He had explanation using Excel, uh, like, like I think Christian said to someone, um, of collaborative filtering with the matrices and using solver, which I've never used in Excel. So Excel doing gradient descent in Excel is quite a foreign thing to me. I think it now, I, I recall, you know, the last couple of years hearing about Microsoft Everyone's talking about Python these days, but Microsoft has been uh, acquiring R companies, you know, companies that use R, not Python, like Revolution Analytics, they acquired a couple of years ago, which maybe is a surprise to people who use Python, but I guess under the hood, maybe Excel and other products from Microsoft perhaps are using the, uh, you know, the analytics from the R companies that Microsoft has acquired. So they do things like gradient descent and other types of analytics in their products now. And I haven't used any of that for Excel. So I, I may try out some things in Excel just to get a better feel for it. Yeah, I mean, Tony, this, this one on Solver, this is like a really old problem. This is basically linear optimization and you know, this has been around for absolutely ages. So, so in the past you could have used um, Excel for that. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I'm not touching Excel if I don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jer Jeremy, um, outside of the current lesson, I am I'm trying the uh, quick draw doodle challenge, and I, I hope to try the um, human protein challenge. William, I share is sorry. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, you should definitely check out the protein challenge. I've got some 
code up uh, that uses fast AI v1. So uh, yeah, I, th I think it's a fun one. There's there's some uh, some interesting parts to it. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the start. Yeah, thanks for that. So the uh, the protein challenge it doesn't have the RGB right. To what I understand, it's got two channels or, or something channels. like that. It's got four. Yeah, if it the was two, it would be. Yeah, if it was two, it might be a little bit better because you can just. <laughs> some people like just uh, average the two and make a third channel, something like that. But with with the four, it's a little bit tricky. But uh, and I did have to. <laughs> I pulled down the newest library and it broke like everything I had written. So uh, I had to fix. <laughs> I had to fix it up to use data blocks, uh, but I, I actually have a new version I'm going to put out this weekend that is actually, I will say with data blocks, it's turned out to be a little bit uh, less code once I figured out how to actually get it working. So, Yeah, I mean, I, I like the data block stuff. I mean, it's a bit crazy that each day the API flips around, but um, <laughs> Like, I don't know if you guys saw that on, on Slack where I was super excited about my accuracy and everything and then realized that I was leaking a data, leak, data leakage going on. And uh, one, one thing was basically that I didn't really know how to use the data block API or the trick Jeremy used in, in, in the satellite data. So that's something to be aware of if you do progressive resizing that you pass on your uh, split from, from size class to size class. And basically, the, he he split his data block uh, chain into two parts, basically. So the first part was basically just getting the images and and, and doing the split in in test and uh, in, in in train and valid, and then later on you just pass on or add on transformations and and always reuse the initial split. And but I like the API; it's quite clean. It's it's a very logical API. Only. Once you get a hang of it, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I think you have to put certain. The, um, you have to put that in order, right? You cannot just change the order. Yeah. You have to like keep the order, right? And I yeah, think you cannot good. use the shift tab, right? So you can. Yeah, it's a bit uh, funny. So. That's true. Um, but what I what I actually planned on doing next, like apart from this uh, tabular data, would be um, I wanted to do a bit of topic modeling. So I'm, I'm preparing a dedicated um, corpus of texts and I wanted to try if that really is so easy as he claims to be. Wanted to work on scientific abstracts basically and see if I can predict the subfield where, where, where they originate from. There's a couple of conferences um, like, like uh, geosciences is where I'm coming from and they have like massive amounts of, of uh, like 20,000 people going to these conferences and there's thousands of abstracts and I was wondering if I can use that and build a geoscience language corpus and then predict what's going on. That's what I'm going to do. That'll so be what sort of training? What's yeah. that? What sort of training data? What sort of training uh, size of the training data set do you think you have? I, you would, I, would I mean, I, I wrote a crawler then. but they blocked me so I have to I mean, I have to get these PDFs, so I have to figure out how to get around that. But there's like, I mean, there's, these conferences are going on for 15 years for sure, and all this stuff is still online. So you can crawl maybe like five or 6,000 abstracts for each year. So it's quite a bit of text. Mm -hmm. I think um, Jeremy had mentioned uh, then, how he had gathered the data during the last uh, fast day course. OK. And if I remember right, yeah. the light bulbs. He had also made an RNN model, which kind of was able to kind of do a kind of a scientific, uh, you know, text output as well, right? Yeah. If you talk about yeah. a particular aspect of, uh, you know, a, a science area, it was able to kind of generate text, which may or may or may not be completely coherent and logical, but was yeah. very much in the kind of domain per se. Yeah, I mean, as as a label, I just planned actually on uh, getting the. I mean, they all have metadata assigned, right? They all have their sessions and sub-sessions where they are allocated to. And I'll probably just use those as labels, I guess. OK, I see. I see. I yeah, makes sense. Yeah. What are, what are you guys like planning on doing, going into NLP or like more the uh, tabular one? Or what, what's the interest vision? I am actually quite interested in the NLP stuff because there are various things we can do with NLP which are not possible with 
vision or some of the stuff oh, and so also yeah. we will never be able to focus and we will never have the we will always get enough data in case of nlp because we can always like crawl and 80% of the data on internet is nlp stuff i think i'm more interested in that same goes for me uh, i want to dive into nlp but i think i need to build a better machine for that because the single gcp thing is not working out well yeah i want to do nlp too i want to find out who really wrote the shakespeare canon anyone know what i'm talking about there's been a controversy since the 1700s did shakespeare write the plays and i want to okay. use nlp to see if there's a signature the first thing i would be to prove did one person write it or was it a i'm a group of people and that's the one i want to attack first can i prove only one person wrote the canon or did a bunch of people if a bunch of people did then he obviously didn't write it okay that's a cool project yeah, it was uh, for sensory mystery Yeah. I mean, there's a couple of uh, maybe you can you can look into this um, uh, author like uh, uh, plagiarism um, software tools. They 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 do basically author allocation within scientific texts. Basically, there were mm -hmm. I saw a couple of them where they were allocating okay, which <clears throat> authors excuse me actually contributed how much to a certain scientific work, and they they basically yeah. found pieces like this one was. probably from this author this from the other one so there's maybe some well, I was studying that like seven years ago I wrote like a dozen python programs and I wrote a uh, what is it a uh, what is it concordia and I used two versions one was the moby version of shakespeare and then in uh, what is it um, oh come on um like the archive uh Of the Gutenberg, they have a copy of the canon, per se, because there's been some changes. And uh, but anyway, so but and there was talk of of that then. They were using Italian, I think, trying to verify some Italian writers if they had a, a written, but I haven't kept up. But now that I'm playing with this, this is probably a the better way to to uh, to determine if uh, Shakespeare wrote his plays. That's nice. It's a nice one. That's a really interesting use case. Yes. So I've been kind of stuck up only in lesson three. You know, basically having problems with GCP P four being able to run those lessons. Yeah. Kind of shift over from P four to KIT because KIT had a bigger memory than P four. You know, even though you know as a as a performance P four is a better kind of a machine than KIT. But I had to shift to KIT and then had to run all those. Uh, you know. lessons from scratch and it, it worked it worked really well so now i'm kind of hunting to get the next p100 in uh, in a gcp right. and be able to do it yeah. and it's a problem you know getting the gcp zones at some point of time they all kind of go not available right so that's that's yeah, something i was, I was fighting that for a couple of days as well it's it's just a pain i don't know i was using this uh, preemptive uh, script this uh, fast ai uh, shell and that kind of didn't work for three days probably because of the cheap uh, preemptive instances were just not available i don't know and i was moving around the images from zone to zone i thought okay that's i'm wasting a lot of credits just moving bits around instead of actually computing stuff yeah i was not successful with the laser so then stuck to just one zone if i get it i use it if i don't then yeah. i just wait for it actually i i i went back to to crestle they have a k80 as well and that's it's pretty solid yeah so Crystal has been working really well, even though you don't. Get, my understanding is Crystal still works on GCP, and uh, mm -hmm. the fact is, you get it on Crystal, but you don't get it on GCP yourself. So yeah, they probably put like a big block of compute. I don't know. Crystal yeah. works on AWS. Yeah, for me as well. It works yeah, on AWS. Okay. I also use Crystal, and uh, the the only issue I have there is the seventy uh, five gig storage uh, size, and uh, and for some, mm -hmm. like for the Google quick draw competition. You need more space and, and stuff sure. like that. But Michelle, uh, one tip. Uh, I read somewhere, and I am doing same thing that if you run out of storage, you can move your data into slash tmp directory, and there you have a lot of space available. 
but the only thing is that it will not be backed up for you yeah it'll not be a persistent storage it'll be a temporal storage yeah. yes and it's, it's i think it's really slow to move the data there uh, they use elastic storage or something like that uh, which is why it's slow mm-hmm. so if someone manages to run it in like one epoch under 15 minutes or something um, please let me know on slack <laughs> Is anyone uh, using um, the NVIDIA Docker images? That's something I was looking into last week. Um, they have optimized uh, GPU images. And uh, I just went to a talk where they had um, presented basically that, that, that it's now easier to, to build upon these. And Kai is doing it as well, I think. And I wanted to, to deploy them to the GCP to have like a, a super fast image there, but I didn't. Yeah, it was taking so much time. I was just wondering if someone else is doing that or... Yeah, I'd be they curious... They have own kind of cloud, I think. <laughs> yeah, I'd be curious what the performance is like. Like, do, does it run as fast in the Docker container as it does if you're just running it on the machine? Like... Yeah, I don't know. Um, Apparently, they are like super highly optimized and Kai is raving about them as well. And they also have these um, these new, what are they called? Uh, these ML libraries, uh, Rapid, Rapids. Um, do you know those? Uh, I think I saw the announcement. Yeah, I, I haven't checked it out yet, but it seems it seems pretty cool. Yeah, I was like, yeah. just for the sake of it on my local gaming laptop until I broke the environment. But as long as I was running it, uh, I didn't notice any drop compared to the normal Conda setup. Hmm. Okay. I don't not sure if the um, Nvidia Docker images have um, Python. Uh, I'm Py, PyTorch uh, version one. So yeah, fast they do. AI, they do. They do. They have a PyTorch image, um, yeah. and that's but version one, one, a PyTorch or version old <laughs> point version zero, one. whatever. No, version one uh, alpha. And I plugged on top, like I, I did a custom Docker thing, same like Kai, and and plugged FastAI on top. Okay, I looked at. I looked maybe like five days ago. I didn't see it. Yeah, if, if you go to their, whatever it's called, this this freaky green NVIDIA cloud thingy, and there's a PyTorch container, okay. and that's a, a 1.0. All right, cool. Thanks. Maybe next uh, meetup, we can have Kai or you, Christian, doing a walk-up of you know, how you've been able to get yeah, that. that Kai, Kai should do it, because I'm total noob in, in, in Docker stuff. But um, yeah, I, I managed to, to, to pull the image and, and build one myself, so it's not super hard. But but Kai has uh, worked more with that, and he's using it in production or at work. So yeah. he's m- much more qualified about that. Sure. So we are about 35 minutes past the hour. So what I suggest is let us get into the mini presentations and quickly get them over so that we can continue our discussions uh, with any topics that you know the participants may want to discuss. Is that okay? Sure. Sure. Yep. Okay. So what I would do now is first get on with my mini presentation and then I will pass it on to Christian to do his. Yeah, mine is short, so <laughs> no worries. Okay. Okay. So I could talk a mine. bit more about the doodle challenge if we have some time. Here. Sure. Are you guys able to see this slide? Callbacks? Yep. yep. Okay, yes. thanks. So the mini presentation uh, is about how we use callbacks in the FastAI library, right? And uh, before I kind of go ahead with it, some credit. <laughs> the first is to Akash, uh, who you know, has been doing a FastAI internal webinar series. I have provided the link below in this, in this particular slide. And uh, he does a very good job of walking through the development notebooks of how the FastAI library has been built. And that's where I came across uh, callbacks and, uh, you know, then kind of try to piece it together as to how it works for what we're learning currently. And I, I take you through that. Uh, the other one I'd like to thank is uh, Deepanshu. Uh, he helped me understand basically how the percentage percentage debug works. And that's what I used to kind of uh, work through the, the code and understand what is happening where. Uh, thanks to both of them. Okay. So, um, why I did what I did. So here, when we do the learn.fit1 cycle, this is what we basically do, uh, at least until the uh, convolutional networks. And I believe this also continues in uh, the other models that we have. So magically, this kind of progress bar appears. You have numbers that move. 
you you are able to see the epochs, the, the losses, the metrics and so forth. So I was curious to how they worked. And what I understood is they basically work because of callbacks, right? So what is a callback? Uh, this was new to me and I was kind of trying to get a short understanding of what it is and that's what I have put down below. Basically, it is a, it's a function that you call and it is passed as an argument or as an object in an existing program or a function that you're running. So that's what basically a callback is. Moving forward, so basically how does it work is if you look at the learner class itself, and I have detailed out the inputs and the methods here, you can see that the callback functions and the callbacks are a part of the input into the learner class, right? But when we kind of see the inputs, they, they are like none, there is nothing mentioned by default, right? But what happens is you have to look at the methods. So if you look at the various methods, there's the first method called the post in it. And that method, if you see, it does assign a callback called recorder into the learner. That's when you create a learner, when you say, you know, create CNN and a learner gets created, this method also gets initiated and the recorder callback is assigned to the learner class. And then when we run the fit one cycle, um, it calls in what is called as a learn.fit. And that in fact calls a fit method, which is in a, uh, you know, a, a file called basicchain.py. And we'll go through how each of this kind of interplay. Okay, so this is the learner class. And I just wanted to point your attention to the fact you see the square kind of brackets. That's where in the post init function, you can see that in the callback function, recorder as a callback is initiated when the learner gets created. So that is assigned even before we run the fit one cycle. So what I did was uh, I ran this percentage percentage debug in my notebook when we do the learn.fit1 cycle. And I kind of used that to go into the code and see how it does. So I started out with the fit1 cycle and you can type you know, n for next and keep on going. So I waited until this, you know, the last one, this callbacks got up dot append gets kind of done. And once that is done, I called in and wanted to find out what is the callback, right? And when you see what a callback is, it kind of, it at least blew my mind away. Uh, if you see here, it's a lot of things. So one is the learn itself, the learn class, and you have uh, the, the Y's, the X's, the paths, the complete model itself, uh, you know, how the complete uh, ResNet 34 or ResNet 50, whichever architecture you have called is uh, kind of used and how the last two models are, are the last two layers are changed. All of that is included and, and I've kind of detailed this in the slide. Uh, and it kind of keeps going on, but you know, I wanted to kind of draw your attention to this particular, uh, you know, place where I have kind of circled. So that's where you can see that in the callback functions, you can see that the recorder function is there, right? So you can see that this uh, being called upon. So what I did is then I kind of wanted to go to the Next one, so when I say next, it kind of goes into now the learn.fit method, right? So remember what I said, the post init function, then we call the learn.fit one cycle. The learn.fit one cycle internally calls the learn.fit and that's where we are now, right? And we go through each of these code and that again calls what is called at the very end of the slide, the fit method, right? This fit method is not a part of the learner class, but it's a, it's a function that is there in uh, basic train.py. And that, if you kind of go through, you come to a stage of the code where you assign the, all the callbacks to something called the callback handler. The CB handler is nothing but the callback handler. And then I kind of deep dive to see what the callback handler is. And again, clearly now it says it's recorder and it has everything else uh, in it. Just like you find previously found the callbacks to be. Right, so internally when I kind of went in and see what all the methods is being called from this recorder. So you can see that it is calling something called on train begin. It's calling something called on epoch begin. It's also calling something called on batch begin. And finally, something called on train end, right? So basically, these are basically sub functions or sub methods inside the recorder uh, callback, right? So these are the various things that are called and that kind of helps us get to see these moving metrics that we see when the learn.fit1 cycle is kind of run. So going deeper, and this is where I have listed out what is a recorder and the various methods that are there. So you can see the on train begin, 
here what it does, it kind of initializes the progress bar. The progress bar here is something called as a fast progress, and this is something custom written by FastAI library. And it kind of writes the parameters, right? It has initially the epoch train loss and the validation loss, and whatever metrics that you choose, whether it is the error rate, whether it is the accuracy thresh, they are again, you know, kind of written onto the progress bar. They basically initialize the values, and these values are kind of then accumulated as the, the epoch begins and the batches kind of go through the iterations, right? So the on batch begin starts recording two things, the learning rate and the momentum at the start of the batch. And the last one, which is the on epoch end, what it does, it, it takes all the values that we have collected, which is the epochs, the number of batches, the train loss, the validation loss, any metrics that we have provided, all of it is kind of uh, accumulated and they are kind of formatted in a, in a viewable format or in a readable format, up to six decimal spaces or something like that, right? So that's what you see here, it calls something called format stats. And that's what the format stats does. It formats it into a very readable format. And um, based on the webinar that Akash does, what I also understood was um, what FastAI does is something called as a smoothening of the loss. So normally when you run uh, the functions, the losses can be up or down, but what FastAI does when we see it is it kind of smoothens the loss in kind of a moving average and then publishes it for us to see. Right, so that's something that I that I knew, and if you see the previous kind of uh, you know code, it has something called the smooth loss, right, in the in the function on epoch end, something here, right. So that is something that was also an eye opener for me that that's being done by the uh, fast AI. So that's uh, the basically the one, and I also want to kind of draw your attention to the fact that the recorder class also had the other methods like the plot losses and the plot matrix. And this is what we kind of use, right? This also has a plot LR, which we use, right? So these are the other methods that are there in, uh, in the recorder class. And these basically help us to kind of see what we see when we run that method called learn.fit1 cycle. And there's a lot of thing that goes on behind this uh, particular space. So that's the uh, mini presentation that I had to show today. I have a question. Typically, callbacks you use you, you use them when you you're doing trying to you know you got some computation running and you want to go do something else and let that run some do some sort of asynchronous stuff. Why do you think the callbacks are being used in the fit? Because you know when you're doing fit, you just like you have to wait for it to end. You, you don't need to go and do anything else. I I do not know how to answer that. If anybody else can answer that. Yep. So uh, you can use callbacks in the cases where, so for example, uh, you wanted to do or you wanted to do some calculation or some operation before the beginning of a e beginning of each batch or before the beginning of each epoch. So this is why we have these callbacks. So these callbacks are uh, basically you have the uh, normal fit method, and then you want to write something to your fit method without actually modifying the fit. Uh, you want to do some kind of processing without actually modifying the fit method. So you basically write a callback, you pass this callback in your fit method and your fit method will automatically call your function. So that, that is why we have this in this fast AI library here. Well, I, I think another way to think about it is like a callback is a function you define uh, to be called like later, right? So in some ways, this is like you define a set of functions, you give them to the fit method, and then the fit method, <clears throat> the fit met method calls them at the right times. Like that's that's kind of how the callbacks are used. And I think you're right that sometimes they're used to do more like asynchronous work or achieve like concurrent uh, programs. But uh, I guess this is just another way that you can use them. Or you can pass some custom function. Yep. Okay, so what I will do is now stop my share and Christian, you can take over. Okay. Okay. I have to find my, my window.
I have about like 50 image, uh, windows open. Hang on a second. This one should be used. Okay, can you see the notebook here? Yes. Okay. So I didn't prepare anything as fancy as you, but um, basically I, I wanted to visualize the, the, um, the class activation maps. If, if you don't know what they look like, you scroll down. <laughs> it just went off. Um, so basically here, like, like if you look, look at these two uh, images on the top, right, with, with the guitars, like, like two guitars, and um, the, the actual um, um, highest um, score was, was the one to the right. So the class activation map for this one actually gives you here this kind of a heat map and illustrating which regions of the image actually fired, basically. Um, and basically it's a way to, to visualize if your algorithm is actually detecting the object, the object and not the background or anything like an artifact. So you can, it's kind of good to check what's actually happening. And you can see, I wanted to see like, um, given that I have in, in this data set classification like 11 um, classes, if I put two in there, do they actually make sense and what's happening there? And uh, that's what, what you see further down here. So it's like the, the image and then the 11 classes, uh, the, the Gibson Les Paul here was the strongest and the actual one classified. But there's another one to the left, right? That's the Stratocaster. And they have distinctively different shapes. So the Stratocaster heat map is down here to the second row on the right. And you can see <clears throat> that certain parts of these guitars are at least that's my interpretation, uh, kind of characteristic. So for, for the Gibson, it looks like, okay, the, 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 the body shape, this kind of a dent and, and uh, parts of the body are kind of characteristic. They, it's kind of an iconic form. Um, whereas for the Fender, it might be the, the, the scratch plate plus um, the, the horn of the, of the body plus uh, the, the um, connection. And interestingly, the, the Fender Telecaster, for the guys who know guitars, they often have a maple uh, fingerboard, a, a quite whitish one, and that was kind of characteristic, apparently, for a Fender Telecaster, even though that's on a, on a strut here. That's, I don't know, it's, it's a lot of guesswork, but it's just neat to visualize what's, what's, what's going on, I guess. And it's fairly simple to do. So I, basically what I did was, um, there was a forum thread um, by Henry Paul, and he had a notebook there and I kind of took it and, and modified it a bit and he was quite helpful. Um, so that's the first visualization and I can go from the top, what do you actually need to do? You need to set up a hook and a, basically a callback thing. Um, and then there's, you can, you can improve on that because that's the last convolutional layer that you map here, right? And therefore you have this coarse resolution of like seven by seven or 10 by 10 pixels that you kind of blur Right, but the resolution is pretty bad. Um, you can do guided backprop, which is a bit more sophisticated, where you basically say, okay, um, given these activations on, on this uh, last conf layer, um, let's uh, propagate that back and, and see which pixels actually um, cause this, this um, conf layer to trigger, right? And then because you have all kind of overlaps here, you, you could probably can't see that here. It's like a big cloudy thing happening. So you can't really see much. And then you can improve on that in, uh, if you kind of regularize your gradient and only allow positive gradients. And then you should see like a signal. Unfortunately, um, I have problems with PyTorch in my case. So I have to run the different parts of the notebook to see it because I don't know, there's something wrong with the callbacks or the hooks that they are not cleaned up. And if I do one, I can't do the second one. So I don't know. You would he see here with the correct one, you would see like, like a bit of the guitar, like as a, as a, as a shape, right? And that's the, the feature basically that's propagating. Um, don't have it here, unfortunately. So the way how it's done is basically that you define a custom hook. And let me, so that's the original image up here. I'm just scrolling. There's a lot of other boilerplate codes, which I don't bother you with. Um, so basically, where is it? Up here. So basically you, you load your model 
everything fine. Then you specify the last convolutional layer in, in your architecture. And that's a bit tricky, so it depends on the model. Um, so that's the first part. So it's the not the head, but the I don't know what's it, what's it called the the lower end. Um, and then it's basically the last one, right? So it's you have to look it up. Uh, I I just followed what 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 he found. So it's the last convolutional layer in in the sub block of the model. That's your target layer, and then you define a callback. A hook output basically for this layer, so it's kind of setting a recorder to 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 record what's happening in this layer. And basically, you give this target layer and the gradient uh, torch hook function here um, to fast AI to the callbacks. It's kind of getting uh, registered, I guess, and for backward passes. Okay, so you specify if it's a forward or backward. And that's pretty much it. So the, the, that's the conf layer that we're targeting. And then basically, when you do, when you do a prediction or a run, you, you do basically a, a dedicated backward run. And you do the backward run for a certain class. So you do a one-hot encoding for your class you want to map. And basically, you back propagate from the last layer this very strong signal for your, I don't know, in my case, for the first one for the Gibson. And that back propagates and is recorded basically. And this one, the, you, you then basically, um, here, here's the backward call. And then basically, you um, linearize it and then you can. Um, make the heat heat map. You you get the result. I, I didn't really read much into the theory, but that's about it. So it's like a couple of lines of code. Um, yeah. Just I, I mean, there's a bit more explanation if you. I mean, there's a couple of papers, obviously, which I will link in in this in this notebook as well. But it's it's kind of easy, and this one. The, 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 the plain uh, heat map activation uh, mapping works um, reliably. I'm still fighting with the, with the guided back propagation, which is neater, but uh, I don't know what's happening there. I have too little understanding of PyTorch or the inner workings of the callbacks and hooks to understand what's going on. So you can unregister basically hooks. It's probably what, what goes wrong that I don't clean up or something. Yeah. That's all that I have to tell. Yeah, I did. I've run into that too with the uh, the PyTorch hooks. If you run through it, but then you don't unregister them, then they can kind of just like stay on your model, and it gets a little bit weird. Yeah, it's, it's basically a kernel restart is is needed. So I, even even just I don't know deleting stuff doesn't really help. I don't know if that's in the memory then of the GPU or something. It's really funny. Did, do yeah, you have was, some, some 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 cleanup code or anything I can steal? Uh, yeah, I can send you. I I was basing mine off of um, he. Jeremy wrote like a save features uh, hook for the last year's course for doing like style oh, transfer. It. Okay. Yeah, um, and in there, there's some sort of like hook dot remove call. There's something you can do to take it off. Um, yeah, cool. Okay. But. I don't know how to adapt that necessarily to like the new uh, library because I haven't used this. I haven't used callbacks.hooks yet. I kind of was just calling the the PyTorch functions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, the, the the second one is, is is simple also, but it's it's just that I, apparently I'm not cleaning up after myself. So for the second mm -hmm. one, basically for this uh, gradient clamping, you you just say okay, you want only the positive gradients. And mm -hmm. record them, and then you get a clear picture where the signal is coming from. All right. Okay, so I think Sandium wanted to do his Google Doodle presentation as well. So we're just reaching there on the R. If everybody's okay, we can have Sandium do his mini presentation as well. Is that okay? Sure. Yeah, I could cool. just talk about the ideas if. If that's okay, just just quickly go over them.
I think Sanyam, we are okay. You can go ahead. Sure. Yep. Um, do you see my screen? Something's coming up. Yeah, it says a started screen sharing. It's only black. Yeah. Still? Is it, yeah. is it still? Yeah. I cannot see it now. No, it says you're sharing, but it's only black. So I don't know what you're sharing. Second screen or something. Um, sorry about that. I, I guess I'll just talk about the ideas. I think my internet is too slow. So uh, the Doodle challenge is basically you have this website by Google where you can draw Basically, you can doodle uh, and it'll try to predict the class. So I think they're using the same crowdsource data set and you have to predict uh, the class of the doodle based on the image or you have the data in the CSV format, which basically tells you how the doodle was drawn by the user. So there are 340 classes. And if you want to work on the complete data set, it's about 50 million images which is a part of the challenge I, I personally feel. And the second thing is because it's, it's um, user drawn doodles. So the data can be noisy. And this I've learned after exploring the worst predictions. So the things that I've been trying is progressive downsizing, which is basically I train on 1% of the data where the image size is 256 by 256. And then 5% of the images with um, 128 by 128 data, uh, the image size, then 10% of the data set with 64 by 64 image size. And the reason for doing this was because uh, the number of files is huge and just the epochs are ta taking too long. And actually I found out that it, it is showing some promise, uh, like the models are actually improving a bit. And this is one of the tricks I've been trying. The other thing is, uh, there was a kernel shared by a grandmaster where he's used just mobile net and that is doing really well in terms of the public leaderboard. So I've been exploring that as well. And if I try to mix the predictions from to average them both, it, it gives a decent boost uh, to the leaderboard. Uh, this is my first Kaggle competition. So this might not sound very impressive to you all, but like I'm, I'm just happy that I'm not at the bottom of the leaderboard. I'm in the top 20% falling down every day, but still. <laughs> That's good. I mean, I, I haven't really managed to, to do a proper competition. I always kind of enroll and start and then <laughs> don't do much. <laughs> it is, it is crazy. I am surprised that even the grandmasters that are in the top three, they share the complete approaches to an extent that you could even replicate it if you have the time and the hardware. Hmm. That's that's what I found really interesting. Do you, do you find it that that it, the solutions are kind of approachable, or, or are they super complicated and sophisticated and hard to really re-implement? Like, are there actually straightforward stuff that that you can kind of replicate, or is it? Because I looked at one or two of them, and they they look like crazy fancy with model ensembling and, and whatnot. On something is basically uh, what I found out is basically averaging the CSV file. So it's not that crazy. It just looks crazy when you draw it out on that final solution. Right. But yes, they're, they're approachable. And the problem for me is the ideas I have right now, I, I cannot execute them because I have a 1070 with 8 gig, 8 gig um, RAM memory. Yeah, I have, I have a feeling for that competition, it's going to come down to uh, computational power just because of the number of images. It's <laughs> Uh, I like I saw someone post it was like you should be able to get top like top five percent if you're just able to train on the full size images with a batch size of at least like 128 and it's like who can actually do that like <laughs> yeah I did try that but uh, this this thing in Linux where you need to format your drive to allow the right number of uh, files in it so I did not take care of it and my accuracy after 40 hours of training it felt uh, it it fell down worse than my baseline, so that's something uh, you might want to look out for. 
Well, what are the what are the images? Because the images there are like vectors, so you have to convert them to images first, right? What, yeah, what so is the what is the like the the size of those images? My impression, like vectors, they could be anything you like, right? And they still will not lose on quality. <laughs> At least that's what I understand, like how vectors work. Like the vector okay. graphic, you can kind of make them bigger, smaller, and they always My keep the same quality. It doesn't allow more than 256 by 256, so I, I did not try beyond that. But Okay. Yeah, the because the, the data itself is actually like strokes. So it's like a stroke that somebody drew, and you can project that onto like a different size kind of canvas, if that makes sense. And um, I mean, people reported empirically that the bigger images are, are better. I think it's because in the end, it shows you like more detail because like you can imagine the strokes might be kind of like compressed on a 128 by 128, something like that. Um, but it, I mean, it's a little bit surprising that the bigger images are better given that it, it's not actually like image data. It's just like what people drew, but that, that's what people are saying, so. Yeah, interesting. And the other also was kind of reading about on our discussion forums and this competition. So the, the next challenge for that is, so apart from that, the, the data set is huge, is that there's a lot of uh, noise, meaning that basically the labels are wrong on some people even say like 10% of the data. So basically yeah. there, there's yeah. a drawing labeled like a chair where it's in fact something like something different, like a TV or something. Because you so, so there's a because yeah. the users have doodled it and then the algorithm has labeled it to that so probably that's why yeah and th that's yeah. why they're saying that that's why they're saying the larger batch size is going to be key because basically as you increase it it decreases the effect of having like a single or a couple like noisy labels in there uh so if you, if you could get a really big batch size then it wouldn't necessarily matter as much that some of the labels are wrong yeah so are people actually running it like like a, a huge batch size on, on, on four linked big GPUs or what's happening? Some crazy person ran 50,000 images into their GPU, so I have no idea. Yeah, I, I heard somebody <laughs> report they were doing, they were doing batch size 128 by eight, like batch size 128 on eight GPUs. So, uh, I mean, that's that's getting pretty, pretty large there. Okay. And that's with like 512 by 512 images, I think, so. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, I guess one is guess we'll showing like the competition for the hardware. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so we are about okay. 10 minutes, about preaching 10 minutes past the time. So just wanted to kind of uh, also point out to the uh, fact that there is a, a resources page for each of the lessons and all of you would be knowing, but for the sake of somebody who might have joined in, uh, you know, there is a specific lesson page for each of the fast day lessons with resources and uh, in-class discussions and advanced discussions. Please feel free to look them up. We also do have sharing split on the Twimly Slack and the other places. Uh, please, please see them as well. Yeah, excellent. So for next week, again, if anyone's interested to uh, chart the meeting, please reach out to the Slack and uh, great. Thank you. Yep. Also, we have mini presentations if anyone is interested to present some idea. I have one doubt. So did anyone try this uh, language modeling approach or IMDB approach on any other data set? Because I tried it on Amazon mobile reviews and my vocabulary size is around 43,000. And no matter how I split my data, I am getting size mismatch errors. And if I look into the model, I see the model itself been built on the size of the vocabulary. So if uh, we do not have same vocabulary in our testing set and in our, as in our training set, then we are not even, not even able to train our model so anyone tried any other data which have less than 60,000 because 60,000 is default in fast way i had tried it on uh, i tried it on lyric modeling or uh, during the last last fast day so i'll have to try it again this time i, I actually plan to do that yes because uh, the model which i am trying uh, the data set which i am trying on is 
does have only 43,000 unique vocabulary and I'm not even able to train it. And each time I'm getting size mismatch error. I have even created a form set for it, but uh, no one has seen it yet. I'm not sure, I'll, I'll have to dig into that. Okay, sure. Thanks. Yeah, I think um, that's it for this uh, meetup. Thanks for joining and uh, look forward to seeing you guys for the next meetup as well. Thanks, thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye bye. Michael, are you there? So I don't need to pause or stop recording. I just can end the meeting, right? Yep. Okay, great. Thanks. No problem. Thank you.